Hi everyone, welcome to statistics and the data analysis. Uh, so starting from today, we will try to use videos to help us uh, study the concepts about this course. St uh, for today, I will talk about descriptive statistics. Okay, basically that's about how may we uh, use some tools or methods to describe our data. So that's something uh, not very difficult and this should be suitable for a starting point. Um, before that, I want to say something to you, uh, as this is maybe the first time for you to use videos to do studying. One of the reasons for me to record these videos is that because this class is really um, of high diversity. Okay, Some of you have never heard about statistics, but some of you are actually using statistics in his or her works. So we have very different backgrounds. So if I try to teach whatever um, materials in the ordinary statistics course in class, then some of you may feel boring, while some of you may feel I am doing too fast. So if I made it as a video, then for those of you who are comfortable about the materials, or maybe you have learned it in the past, then you may try to, uh, for example, play it in a higher speed to save you some time, or even just skip it. If you have uh, read about the um, slides and you know that you know the materials, then you can skip it, that's fine. But if you want to really get into the details, maybe because you don't have the related background, or because you want to um, understand all the details, then you may even replay the videos for several times, So if that's convenient for you. Okay, so that's one of the major reasons that I want to use videos for doing this course. I know that uh, it's not usual because most, most professors don't do that. I also know that this is just a trial. So we will see how things go. If most of you do not like it, I will try to adjust. Okay, but let's try to do it at least for this week. So, the plan today is tell, uh, to tell us how may we visualize data. What we want to do is to provide some kind of summaries. Okay? Sometimes we get data. There are a lot of values in the data. So, it's hard uh, to start anything if we don't do some summarization to get some rough ideas or intuitions first. So, we will tell you how to use graphs or how to use statistics or uh, I mean the numbers, okay, to summarize your data. That's going to be always the first step for any data analysis project. Before we apply any rigorous or complicated methods, we need to first get our intuition about the directions to go or to clean some data or something else, okay? Always try to summarize or visualize your data before you try to do anything. I think that's um, you shouldn't and um, you shouldn't feel that's weird. Okay, that's something that you are doing now. So today I will introduce concepts about graphs, about some common statistics we may use. But also I will try to use this video to help you review some basic algebra and the mathematical notations. Mathematics is not the heart of this course, I understand. I will show you some formula, but I will never ask you to do those derivations with your pen and paper. That's not the co focus of this course. Okay? But I hope through the demonstration of those formulas, at least you can know what we are talking about. I hope that our the concepts can be conveyed to you precisely. That's why we use notations. Okay, so that's my plan. And then to help you really know the ideas and know how to play with data, Monday we will tell you how to write our codes to generate those graphs, statistics, and find some information from them. Okay, so the first thing I want to do in this video is to start our introduction about data graphs. The first thing that all we want to do is to actually group your data. What's that? Suppose these 50 numbers 
are your meet and grades. Okay, uh, not very good, but don't worry, there's no meet and at all. So suppose you get these 50 numbers. We say these data are ungrouped. So that means each value is just one number there. Okay, they have not been grouped to any classes. If that's the case, in general, visualizing these numbers can be hard. So we always try to group them into a frequency distribution before we do anything. What's that? We're going to create some classes, okay? That's just intervals. Say, for this data, maybe I choose 10 to 20 to be an interval, 20 to 30 to be another interval. And then for each interval, I'm going to count the frequencies of those uh, from this data. And then that's going to give me a frequency distribution. So for this particular example, let's try to do it. The first step I want to do is to find the minimum and the maximum numbers because I want all my classes together can cover all these numbers. So I first calculate something called range, which is the maximum number minus the minimum number. That's going to be 51 for my data set here. Okay? With that, um, for just for um, based on my experience or just based on my preference, let's say I want to create six classes and I want to use 10 to be the class size. Okay? Because 10 is a good number and 6 times 10. Let's going to be long enough to cover my range, okay, to cover all the data. Another way for you to find class width is to do calculations like this, okay. I have 51 as my range, and I have 6 classes, so I do a simple uh, division. I can see that at least for each class, the size must be at least 9. So that's some reason for me to try 10. Probably you want to ask yourself, what's the point not to choose something smaller? Okay, of course that's because some data will be missing when we group data, if the class sizes are not large enough. So, with that, I'm going to create six classes, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The first one starts from 20 and then goes to 30. The second one goes from 30 to 40 and so on and so on. Here, each notation here, each pair of numbers here are bracket with a left square bracket and a right parenthesis. Okay? Mathematically that means we include the lower bound but exclude the upper bound. So 30 belongs to class 2 instead of class 1. The math notation here is not very important as long as you understand it or yeah, even if you don't really like it, that's fine. The point here, or the really important point here is we need to make sure that the classes do not overlap, especially at class midpoints, uh, sorry, at um, class end points. Okay, when we define our, when we de define our class intervals, we need to make sure that things are clear enough. And that's done with these particular cares about our endpoints. Here, I choose to exclude the upper bound. But if you like, you can choose to exclude the lower, lower bound. Okay, that's the, that's the decision maker's uh, discretion. Anyway, I got these intervals and I have precise definition. So I can start to count the frequencies, okay? I can say, uh, okay, the first number was that, and then I add the frequency of one of the class by one, and so on and so on, until I put the 50 numbers into these six buckets. And then that's going to be my frequency distribution. We say this is a set of grouped data. Those original numbers disappear, but now I have six groups, one with a class interval and the frequency. That's how data are grouped into classes. Something to remind you. First, if there are outliers, they should be removed first. Okay? This actually can be done when you group data. Once you group the data, you probably will see uh, there is a class 
that is far from all other classes who has frequency positive frequencies. Okay, in that case, that's going to and uh, you you can choose to remove that point if you think that's an outlier, which is something too extreme, and uh, should be um should does not correspond to any common values. Okay. In that case, you may want to remove those two extreme points. And then, uh, in general, we suggest you to create 5 to 15 classes. But of course, the number of classes is 100% your own choice. You are going to choose the class sizes and the number of classes to make the graph easy to understand and uh, um, pretty. And again, that's your own decision. Then. Um, as I mentioned, be aware of class endpoints. Okay, sometimes we may want to add some more things into a frequency table. Okay, here are frequencies. Sometimes we want to add class midpoints. Okay, midpoints just means the middle point of that interval. So for the first class, that's 25. For the second, that's 35. Sometimes we want to include this as a column to provide more information. And then, sometimes we want to add a relative frequency or just the proportion of numbers in that class compared to the whole data set. So for in this case, we have 50 numbers, right? So this sixth number counts for 12% of all the data set. And then, we probably want to add cumulative frequencies. We accumulate the frequencies from the bottom class to the top class. Typically, we do it from small to large. So 6 is here. 24 is 6 plus 18. That means there are in total 24 uh, people or 24 numbers below 40. And then there are 35 numbers below 50, and so on and so on. At the end, it must be goes to 50 if our calculations are correct. Sometimes some people add cumulative relative frequencies. Okay, but that's not so common. Okay, so with that, we're going to create our first data graph, which is one of the most important. That's histogram. Okay, histogram is simple. It just translates a numeric frequency table or frequency distribution into a graph. For each class, we draw a bar or a rectangle to represent how many numbers are there, what's the frequency there. So the first bar or the first rectangle here tells us that for the class between 20 to 30, we have 6 people. From 30 to 40, we have 18, and so on and so on. Okay. Sometimes if you want, you may add numbers here to make it clearer okay sometimes you don't need to do that one thing i want to emphasize is that if we are drawing histogram from a frequency distribution then these rectangles should be contiguous okay there shouldn't be any empty gaps between these rectangles if there are some gaps we say this histogram is not really correct Okay, why? Because we know these classes, these intervals them, themselves do not contain any holes or do not contain any gaps, right? So when we draw those pictures, there shouldn't be gaps there. That's how we connect the frequency table with the data graph here. Okay, so this particular histogram is going to help us understand in one shot to understand the distribution of these numbers. Okay, that's going to give our first intuition or the first impression of these numbers. So, as we mentioned, histograms may be one of the most important data graphs. And we're going to see it uh, many, many times throughout this semester. That's because we want to see distribution. At this moment, we have not formally introduced what's the idea of distribution, but you probably can intuitively understand that that's how data, how numbers distribute within the range. 
Okay, so we're going to go to details later. Also, no, don't forget, always keep in mind that we may want to identify and kick away outliers. Sometimes when we want, we may draw lines to connect those class midpoints instead of use several rectangles to depict a distribution. In that case, we say we are drawing frequency polygons. Okay, so that's an alternative of drawing histograms. One of the reasons for doing that is if we have multiple, multiple distributions or multiple frequency distributions to compare with each other, then drawing several lines here will be better than drawing many, many rectangles. Okay, we want our graphs to be easier to interpret. But also, this is going to give people or give the readers of your graph um, some, um, some wrong image. They may misinterpret your data to with some time sequence. Okay? Because when we draw something like the history sales data, we use a line chart. And from left to right, that means two months is ago, one month is ago, this month, the next month, and so on and so on. But here you can see there is really no time concept in our data set. Okay? So using frequency polygons may be convenient, but sometimes it's also dangerous. Again, that's the decision maker's decision um, decision maker's discretion to choose the best graph that is most appropriate for him. Okay, so I'll stop here. In the next video, I'm going to continue on data graphs to introduce another four common data uh, graphs. Thank you.